In this short video, we will show you something most people don't realize about what causes us to trip and fall and how to avoid this dangerous hazard. Slips, trips, and falls constitute the majority of general industry accidents and result in back injuries, strains and sprains, contusions, and fractures. A trip happens when your foot or lower leg hits an object and stops, but your upper body continues moving, resulting in loss of balance. But first, let's understand one very important thing that we all have in common. Can you tell what it is? When a person takes a step, their foot comes off the ground about half an inch before it steps back down again. Therefore, anything that sticks up a half inch or more can cause you to trip, and then your momentum can cause you to fall. If you're lucky, you'll walk away with a few bumps and bruises, but for the not so lucky, falls result in 15% of all accidental deaths and are second only to motor vehicles as a cause of fatalities. What did you trip over the last time you fell? People tend to trip over things that we see all the time but don't normally notice. Things like a slightly curled up edge of a carpet or mat, extension cords, uneven walking surfaces like cracks in sidewalks or other walking surfaces. Thresholds in doorways, tools, even those cute little pets snoozing in doorways cause hundreds of falls every day. Can you spot the trip hazards in this photo? Here's one where the surface changes elevation about an inch and another change in elevation. Would you see this one? And two more changes in elevation, each more than half an inch. Anywhere you see a crack in a walking surface lurks a potential trip hazard. This is a joint in the sidewalk. Hard to see, but the difference here is almost three quarters of an inch, more than enough to cause a fall. But can you see the other hazard? Here, almost invisible, but the crack should be enough to warn you. The elevation here changes only slightly, but enough to cause a hazard. We can get so used to hazards we forget they're there. This one was painted yellow, but it's been scuffed over so many times it's getting harder to see. A common type of hazard is any area where one type of walking surface ends and another begins, like where carpeting meets tile, or the edge of a parking lot. Sharp, unexpected changes in elevation are particularly dangerous. This one's much bigger than half an inch. A warning could save a terrible injury or even a life, maybe your own. A simple door threshold sticks up enough to trip anyone walking in or out. Hazards hide in plain sight, especially if the lighting is bad or if we are doing something that blocks our vision. Pay attention. If you're walking and texting, reading, daydreaming, or doing anything other than not paying attention to where your feet are going, you might as well be walking blindfolded because your eyes are not working for you, they're distracted. You can avoid injury because tripping and falling is preventable. Keep in mind that it's the little things we don't normally look for that can hurt us the most. As you're walking today, how many trip hazards can you spot? At work, at home, in the parking lot, or wherever you go. Remember, it only takes half an inch to change your day for the worse. Use your eyes and be aware of those little trip hazards as you walk. Thanks for watching and have a safe day. What does being prepared really mean? Well, it's not any single thing. It's a combination of common sense, knowledge, and awareness of your surroundings. But to be truly prepared, 
It's essential that you know the emergency evacuation plan of your building. Whether you work in an office park or a manufacturing facility, each building will have its own unique design and its own unique emergency evacuation plan. These plans usually include evacuation or relocation procedures, recommended escape routes, and procedures for reporting fires and other emergencies. Some may contain detailed floor plans and the names of evacuation coordinators in each work area. The plan should also address the special needs of employees with disabilities. Remember, while it's the responsibility of building management to provide an emergency evacuation plan, it's your responsibility to understand it. And if you really want to get serious, take a few minutes during your lunch break to walk through the building and identify escape routes. The more you know about your building, the better prepared you'll be. You should also be able to recognize the sound of your building's evacuation alarm so you can react quickly when you hear it. Even if you think there's no real cause for concern, don't ignore the alarm. Never assume it's a false alarm or a test. Always assume it's the real thing. Dean, come on, let's go. Then follow your evacuation plan. Another important way to get prepared for an emergency is to participate in evacuation drills. Attention, please. May I have your attention, please? We have received a fire alarm. Treat these drills seriously. Take the time to learn about your building's fire safety features, such as the way the PA system is used to coordinate the evacuation. Familiarize yourself with all of the escape routes available to you from your work area and plan where you will go if your primary evacuation plan must change. The more familiar you become with your emergency evacuation plan, the faster you'll react and make informed decisions, like closing your office door or shutting down equipment that could make a fire worse. Remember, the objective of a drill is an orderly evacuation, not just a speedy one. It's about learning to prepare for the unexpected and knowing your egress routes. An egress system is a series of protected paths that help employees reach a safe location, either inside a building or out. These paths are usually corridors or aisles that lead to an exit, which is usually an enclosed, well-lit, uncluttered stairwell. The stairwells lead evacuees to what's known technically as an exit discharge. This is the area between the exit and a public way, like a street or a parking lot. If you do encounter smoke, get down. Crawl on your hands and knees. Keep your head one to two feet above the floor. That's where the air is cleaner and easier to breathe. Now, about using an elevator during an emergency evacuation, there are some important things you need to know. In many buildings, the elevator goes to the ground floor when smoke is detected either in the elevator lobby or in the elevator machine room. It will stay there until trained fire or rescue personnel take control of it using a special key. They might use the elevator to rescue occupants or begin firefighting operations on the upper floors. Even if the elevator is there waiting, don't use it. That's where it begins, with the understanding that an individual is accountable for his or her safety. Then it's up to you to take the time to be fully prepared. Take the time to learn what every employee should know about emergency evacuation. It's an effort worth making. It could save your life. People cause accidents. To be more exact, 
People not paying attention or doing something that they shouldn't be doing causes accidents. To put it another way, accidents result from varying degrees of carelessness, sloppiness, negligence, inattention, neglect, and ignorance. Accidents also happen where two things are found, unsafe acts and unsafe conditions. Unsafe conditions occur when there is a failure to identify, control, remediate, or train properly against a hazard. Even though there can be multiple human causes, accident investigations will always identify the human failure to correct the hazard. Some unsafe conditions are easy to spot. Finding others needs a closer inspection. For example, liquid on a walking surface is an unsafe condition, but you won't see it if you aren't looking where you are stepping. People create the majority of unsafe conditions. Mother Nature can create conditions, but she gives us plenty of warning signs. If it's cold and wet, or raining or snowing, we should be aware of walking hazards. No matter what nature is up to, we can be aware of it and guard against it. However, unsafe conditions created by people are often harder to find. Overloaded circuits, unguarded machinery, unchained cylinders, altered safeties, blocked fire extinguishers, blocked exits, curled up edges of mats or carpets, spills, poor lighting, unsanitary conditions, speeding, damaged tools, and inappropriately stored chemicals like solvents and gasoline, and poor housekeeping are all examples of unsafe conditions created by people. If you see an unsafe condition and ignore it, you just made it more likely that someone will fall victim, perhaps even yourself. Unsafe acts create unsafe conditions. Unsafe acts are things like failing to properly do a job, failing to see hazards, or taking unneeded risks. For example, speeding up to make the yellow light, using tools in wrong ways, or using damaged or defective tools, not using proper personal protective equipment, ignoring the safety data sheet for chemicals you are using, or deliberately violating safety rules and procedures. How many unsafe acts can you spot today? Which ones are you doing? The worst kind of unsafe act is deliberately creating an unsafe condition. Have you done anything to make the job more risky for you or for others? Although it is difficult to foresee every condition or potential hazard, it's hard to find an accident that could not have been prevented. The person injured may not have caused the conditions that caused the injury, but something they did or something another person did directly led to the incident. The facts from accident investigations are revealing. 99.5% of accidents are caused by people's behaviors. Some don't do it deliberately. Some don't do it because they just did something stupid. Others cause accidents because they think they can do it without getting hurt or they don't think about the consequences of their actions. Some are in a hurry. They allow themselves to become distracted and are not paying attention. One thing to remember, you can make the same mistake many times without anything bad happening. I always did it this way and nothing ever happened until today. Over time, you come to believe that some unsafe conditions or acts are okay because you have no evidence to the contrary. Whatever we do, our job is to identify as many errors as we can and correct them through education, process changes, equipment modifications, or any other way needed to ensure that we all go home safe at the end of each day. Thanks for watching and have a safe day. What the hell happened? I don't know. There's an accident. You were nearby, but you didn't actually see it happen. If the victim is being attended to properly, there are a few things that can make you the next best thing to an eyewitness. First, look at your watch and remember the time. It's a simple detail, but it could become a very important detail when the accident is investigated. Next, look around and see who else is at the scene of the accident.
Delay cleanup of the area until the safety people have surveyed the scene. Think, what caused you to turn your attention to the accident? Was it something you saw, such as a flash? Or was it something you heard? If it were a sound, what kind of sound was it? An explosion? A scream? A crash? Was there just one sound, or were there two or more in sequence? Sniff the air. Are there any unusual odors? What are the lighting conditions? Bright and glaring? Dim? Shadowy? Dark? What color is the light? What are the weather conditions? Sunny and dry? Cloudy? Rainy? Snowy? Is there thunder and lightning? Believe it or not, weather conditions can be important even when an accident is inside. Look at the ground or floor around the accident. What's lying there? Are there any loose items, machinery, junk, wires, or cables? Are there any personal items, such as the victim's hard hat, tools, or eyeglasses? Where are they relative to the victim's position? What condition are they in? What kind of surface is it? Smooth concrete, rough concrete, carpeting, tile, bare wood, gravel, soil? Run your fingers along the surface. Is it wet, sticky, oily, powdery, dry, slick? Look directly overhead. Is everything as it should be? Are any wires or light fixtures swinging as though recently disturbed? Are there any exposed electrical wires? Is there an overhead crane or walkway? And if so, who or what is up there? Look around at eye level. Is there anything that might shine in someone's eyes, mirrors or other unusual objects which might momentarily distract attention? It's important that you notice as much as possible, as soon as possible, because the scene of an accident can change so quickly. Now that you've made a mental note of all these things, volunteer the information when your supervisor or safety director investigates the accident. A major purpose of accident investigation is to find the cause so future accidents can be prevented. And you never know which detail may be the one that makes the difference. Even though you are not an eyewitness to the accident, there's so much you can see that you just might become the star witness. This is Claude Aikens reminding you that safety is your job too. live in a world of chemicals. Our bodies produce and use chemicals. Plants and trees produce them. Even water is a chemical compound. Other chemicals in our world are man-made synthetic compounds. Although we don't know exactly how many man-made chemicals are in use today, experts generally agree it could be more than 100,000. Gasoline, paints, household cleaners, detergents, toiletries, wipes, solvents, everyday products used at home or work are made of chemicals. Before using any chemical product, you should find out all you can about it, and this information is literally at your fingertips in free publications called Safety Data Sheets, or SDSs. OSHA's Hazard Communication Standard requires chemical manufacturers, distributors, or importers to provide safety data sheets, formerly known as Material Safety Data Sheets, or MSDSs, to communicate the hazards of chemical products. All safety data sheets are required to follow a specific format and provide detailed information in 16 different sections. To protect yourself, your co-workers, and your family members, here are the top 10 things you should look for on a product safety data sheet. What is the emergency phone number? If someone is injured, hurt, falls ill, or poisoned by a chemical product, who would we call to get more information? You can be sure emergency medical personnel, especially physicians and nurses, will want to see the safety data sheet. The manufacturer or distributor's name, address, and phone number is required to be right up front in Section 1, along with 24-7 emergency phone numbers. What is this product recommended for, and are there any restrictions on its use? This information is also required to be included in Section 1. 
How dangerous is this product? Statements like causes irreversible eye damage, highly flammable, and can cause central nervous system damage appear on safety data sheets even for seemingly harmless everyday household products. Section 2 is called hazards identification and it is required to include all hazards regarding the chemical. What do you do if the product gets in your eyes, on your skin? What if you inhale or swallow some? Section 4, first aid measures, lists the signs and symptoms of exposure to the chemicals and whether the effects are usually immediate or delayed and the appropriate first aid measures to take. If the product is accidentally spilled or otherwise released from its container, how do we clean it up? What materials can we use and how do we dispose of everything properly? Should we wear masks or gloves, eye protection? All this should be listed under Section 6, Accidental Release Measures. Are there any specific cautions we should be aware of to make sure we are safely handling and storing the containers of this product? Is it dangerous to store in certain places or near other chemicals or products? Does it have to be in a temperature controlled environment? Section 7, Handling and Storage, provides this information. When using this product, what personal protective equipment should we be using? Should we use special gloves, splash goggles, or protective clothing? What should we do to prevent exposure to any hazardous chemicals in the product? Will we need to provide extra ventilation? Section 8, Exposure Controls Personal Protection, tells us what we need to do to engineer a safe environment when using the chemical. What does the product look like? What color is it? Does it have a distinctive odor? Are the vapors heavier or lighter than air? At what temperature will it ignite? Is it an acid or alkali? Section 9, Physical and Chemical Properties, lists the chemical characteristics we should know. What other materials should never be mixed with this product? Can it become unstable if exposed to heat, light, or anything else? Could this product react with other materials like metals, causing it to decompose into a dangerous hazardous chemical? Some chemicals, when combined with certain others, can cause an explosion or fire. Section 10, Stability and Reactivity, outlines these cautions along with any known hazardous reactions. One of the most important sections of the SDS is Section 11, Toxicological Information. Could repeated exposures to this product cause allergic reactions? Are there any short or long-term health effects to exposure? Is this product associated with birth defects? Can exposure cause genetic mutations? Can it affect reproductive organs or the development of a fetus? By what routes can this chemical enter our bodies? And is anything in this product known to promote or cause cancers? Section 11 outlines this important information. When working with chemicals, we can never have enough information. Get the safety data sheets and read them thoroughly. Protect yourself, your coworkers, and your family. Personal Protective Equipment, or PPE for short, is equipment that will protect you against health and safety risks at work. It's not a new idea. People have used PPE for centuries to protect themselves. But in the modern workplace, PPE includes items like safety helmets, gloves, eye protection, face masks, and safety footwear. PPE is incredibly important because it provides a last line of defense against injury, and it can save your life but only if you use it. Regrettably, people continue to sustain head injuries because they don't wear hard hats. Feet are damaged because people choose to not wear safety shoes. And people foolishly risk their sight because they won't wear eye protection. Injuries can result in permanent disabilities, blindness, or even death. So, knowing all of this, why do people choose to not wear PPE? For some, it's a matter of comfort. Others feel that it slows them down. Some people simply don't see the need to wear it, especially for quick jobs. And most astonishingly of all, some people choose to put their lives in danger because they think it makes them look silly. Whatever the reason, there is no excuse for not wearing PPE. 
In this PPE awareness course, we will explain why not taking PPE seriously can have devastating consequences. We'll look at some common PPE types and the hazards they protect us from. And we'll discuss how you can look after your PPE so it can continue to look after you. As we go through our workday, we touch a lot of surfaces, some of which might be contaminated. Millions of workers every day are at risk from contaminations called blood-borne pathogens. Blood-borne pathogens are present in infected human blood and certain other bodily fluids, and some of them carry potentially fatal diseases. No matter what kind of work you do, you should always be aware of the risk of exposure to blood-borne pathogens, because when you know the risk, you can take precautions. You can be exposed to a blood-borne pathogen by touching an infected person or their secretions, or you can be exposed by touching something that has been contaminated by an infected person. So how do you protect yourself? You have to understand that something can be contaminated and the infected organism may not be visible. For example, linens, tabletops, washrooms, door handles, anything that may have been used or touched by someone else can spread a dangerous germ or virus. When you come into contact with an infected surface, the organism can transfer to you. Once it is on your body, any body opening can allow this pathogen to enter your system. This includes your nose, mouth, eyes, other body openings, any mucous membranes, and any cuts, abrasions, or any other breaks in the skin. For example, if an infected person coughs or sneezes on a table, which is not cleaned after use, and then you touch the table with your hands, the infection may now be on your hands. If you rub your eyes or eat anything, the infection can pass into your system. This can be prevented by following simple guidelines that will protect you from exposure. You don't know if someone with a contagious disease has touched the surface, so good hand washing is the first and most effective method to prevent spreading infections. Always treat blood, body fluids, broken skin, and mucous membranes as if they were infected, and use proper gloves before cleaning anything that may have been exposed. Wash your hands before putting on gloves and immediately after removing them. If soap and water is not available, you can use a waterless hand sanitizer. Never touch clean objects with contaminated gloves and avoid touching your face, eyes, nose, or mouth until after you have washed your hands. Protect yourself from bloodborne pathogens, use appropriate disinfecting agents, and use proper hand washing techniques. Thanks for watching and have a safe day. Before you lift anything, take a moment to consider these five important guidelines. 1. How heavy or bulky is the item being moved? Know the weight of the load before you try moving it. Also, is the load too bulky to handle by yourself? Are there any other special considerations before lifting? Can you clearly identify the points where you can get the best and safest grip on the load? 2. Can you lift the load manually or will you need help? Help could be in the form of a second lifter or a step up to some type of a mechanical lift assistive device. You should know your personal limitations. In other words, what amount of weight can you safely lift without risking injury? Even if the load is within your limits, consider using mechanical help whenever possible. But if the item is heavy or ungainly, get help. Don't let your ego get you in trouble. Get a second person, a hand truck, forklift, dolly, or whatever else is available. 3. What location is the load coming from? Are you moving something from a hard-to-reach place like overhead or far back on a shelf? Does it have to be lifted out of a container? Is it in a tight area that may give you trouble? You want to be able to position yourself as close to the load as possible before lifting. The closer you are, the less strain on your body. If it's back on a shelf, 
slide it out to get it closer. If it is coming out of a tight area, make sure you have adequate room for your hands and arms. Watch out for pinch points, be aware of any adjacent obstructions, and always make sure you can see the top before moving. 4. What is the destination point? Before you lift anything, think about where the load will be placed. Will it be going somewhere overhead, in a narrow, tight spot? What special precautions should be taken before you get to the end point? Will you have enough room? At the destination, don't try to shoehorn something into position. Allow yourself as much room as possible to set the load down. Avoid hitting anything nearby. You can always shift it after it's down. 5. What route do you have to follow while carrying or moving the load? Check the path from start to finish. Are there any tripping hazards, trash or debris on the floor? Any holes that could break your ankle? Any changes in floor elevation that could throw you off balance? Any loose, uneven or unstable footing like grass, dirt, broken concrete, gravel? Will you be going through any doorways, blind intersections or anywhere else that you should be aware of? Are there any wet, slippery areas? Very important, how is the lighting along the route? And if you are moving from inside to outside or from outside to inside, are you prepared to deal with the lighting changes? Traveling in or out of doors can cause temporary vision loss while your eyes adjust to the lighting changes. Remember, the shortest way isn't always the best or the safest. Know the high fives of back safety and always plan your lift. Ever heard of hazardous energy? Imagine something like this, or maybe something more like that. Not quite. Hazardous energy is any form of energy found around the workplace that poses a potential hazard. It comes in many forms. Electricity is a common one, but hydraulic pressure, radiation, and even gravity can sometimes be considered hazardous energy. Modern machinery can utilize many types of energy, but when the machines are shut down for maintenance, that energy may not just go away. Workers can be injured when energy is released unexpectedly. So to keep them safe, extra precaution must be taken when working with this equipment. That precaution is called lockout, tagout. There are many variations on LOTO processes and programs, depending on the type of hazardous energy present but they all share four basic ideas that are addressed before work begins. One, identify potentially hazardous sources of energy. Two, disconnect those energy sources from the equipment. Three, apply lockout or tagout devices to temporarily prevent reconnection. Four, confirm that the system is safe. Lockout tagout systems must adhere to OSHA's lockout tagout rules as described in 29 CFR section 1910.147. As important as they may seem, lockout tagout plans get overlooked far too often. As lockout tagout is commonly found in OSHA's annual top 10 list, in 2015 it was number 5. For more information about LOTO programs and the equipment used, visit graphicproducts.com or follow the link, fill out the form, and get your free copy of our Lockout Tagout Best Practice Guide. Asbestos-containing materials hidden within existing products have been in use for thousands of years. In fact, it was mined from rock formation in ancient times as a wick for lamps, tablecloths, textiles, and other useful items. 
In modern times, asbestos has been used for many products such as fireproofing, pipe insulation, theater curtains, siding, roofing, gaskets and packing, water and sewer pipe, and more. In water and wastewater applications, asbestos cement pipe may contain as much as 20% asbestos or more, which is used as reinforcement for the pipe, much in the same way steel is used to reinforce concrete in bridges and buildings. However, we must understand that the cement used in the pipe can degrade over time, therefore increasing the risk of fiber release. The types of asbestos used are both the serpentine, chrysotile, and amphibole, amosite, and crocidolite. Some people think that asbestos was banned by the EPA, so there is no more asbestos. However, the ban was overturned by the courts, so it is safe to say asbestos is still in existence today in some form or another. In spite of the fact that many manufacturers claim dates when asbestos was no longer contained in their products, their prior product line still contains asbestos. In fact, many companies still have tons of equipment or pipelines. Regulations require that employees must be informed of the presence of asbestos-containing products. In addition, only fully trained individuals should be allowed to perform work with asbestos-containing products or work where fibers may be released in the air. A major fallacy that exists is that no asbestos is released from products such as gaskets, packing, or cementitious materials. The employer must also ensure that proper containment, storage, and labeling of asbestos-containing products are complied with until picked up by an asbestos-certified waste management firm. It's also important to consider the certification, training, and qualifications of any contractors before bidding or starting work with AC pipe or related products. So be sure to obtain copies of any permits, licenses, and training certifications for your due diligence file. If employees will be using respiratory protection, then the employer must develop and implement a full respiratory protection program, including training, physicals, and fit testing at a minimum. The anticipated level of respiratory protection will be dependent on an industrial hygiene prediction of aerosolized levels of an asbestos What is a confined space? Ugh, Peggy, I just finished another corporate webinar and I found out I need to inventory all of our confined spaces. Do you even know what a confined space is? I think I can help, Paul. Many workplaces have areas that are confined spaces according to OSHA. There are only three characteristics that all confined spaces must have. One of the first things to check for is if an employee can fit their entire body into the area. If they can enter completely and perform the work required, then it may be a confined space. A space that is too small for an entire body to get into is not a confined space. The second thing to check for is if the area has restricted entry or exit. Here are some simple questions to consider. Are both hands needed to enter or exit? Must you crawl or contort your body to get in or out? Are there physical obstructions like pipes or holes in the floor? Are ladders required to access the space? If any of these are yes, then it may be a confined space. The last thing to check for is if the space is not designed for continuous occupancy. For example, when that area is operating normally, an employee cannot work in there for their entire shift because of safety hazards. So if an area has all three of these characteristics, it is a confined space according to OSHA. Got it. Let's walk around the warehouse and find some of those confined spaces. Let's look at the pump room. You can easily bodily enter and perform work inside the space. There is no restriction entering or exiting it, and you could be in here during normal operation. So it only meets one of the criteria, so it's not a confined space. What about a dock leveler? Once it's open, you can easily bodily enter before work. Entry and exit is restricted. You can't just walk in or out. 
and it certainly is not designed for somebody to be under there during normal operation. Three check marks means it's a confined space. Gee, Peggy, you're right. The dock leveler has all three characteristics, so I'm going to include it on my confined space list. Let's check out the cardboard baler. From the top, the chute is certainly large enough to bodily enter and perform work, and there is restricted access for entry and exit. And you certainly cannot be in there during normal operation. That'd be very hazardous. Three check marks means it's a confined space. Mission accomplished. I walked around the entire warehouse and inventoried all the confined spaces, but I'll need a break before trying to figure out which of these confined spaces is permit required.